So this is Halloween. So I'll start my slide with a brain attack. So, <laughs> so that's what we deal with day in, day out as a stroke neurologist. So that is a self-explanatory what is brain attack, just like heart attack. So there is a lot of, I mean, my job is talk about cryptogenic stroke today, but I want to get some definitions clear. What is stroke? What is TIA? What is cryptogenic stroke? CNS infarction is defined as brain, spinal cord, and or retinal cell death attributable to ischemia. Most of us forget that retina is part of CNS. So I just want to make sure we understand when we call CNS infarction that includes all three components or one or, most, uh, one or more components of uh, CNS, brain, spinal cord, and retinal cell death. And also that infarction includes either neuropathological, neuroimaging, or clinical evidence of permanent injury. That's only, that, that's the, those are the criteria to be fulfilled when to be called as CNS infarction. When we say ischemic stroke, especially refers to CNS infarction accompanied by overt symptoms. That means people have symptoms. Then there is silent infarction which becomes very important, especially nowadays, if you open any stroke journal, there's a lot of talk about silent infarction, especially in terms of a cryptogenic stroke, because silent infarction, there has been some link with the atrial fibrillation, and also there is some link for a cognitive decline in people with a cerebral infarction. So silent infarction, by definition, they do not have any known symptoms. We'll talk about it during the talk. And when the imaging or pathology is not available, clinical stroke is recognized by persistence of symptoms for at least 24 hours. Those are the definitions that were given. Then, what is TIA? To go back to my previous slide, as you see, for to call it ischemic stroke, we have to have, if you see the last uh, bullet point, clinical stroke is recognized by persistence of symptoms for 24 hours. If it is less than 24 hours, sorry, we call it previously as a TIA. But there is a new tissue-based definition that transient episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal brain spinal cord, or retinal ischemia without acute infarction. So that's the key word here, without acute infarction. We come into, we had several instances where we think the patient had TIA because I'll give you an example. A 60-year-old person comes into the emergency room with a patient right hemiparesis, say an hour later, the deficit completely clears. So at the stage, do we call it stroke, ischemic stroke, or TIA? The reason I'm bringing up is when people say TIA, they don't pay really attention to the individual, oh, it's just TIA, it clears up and they're okay. But in my opinion, TIA is the window of opportunity for a keep the patients well, because by definition, TIA, the, already the deficit has cleared. In this example, a patient right hemiparesis has cleared. So that patient would benefit from whatever we do for that individual evaluation and instituting the secondary stroke prevention. So in this particular example, this patient has cleared, so in 60 minutes, for example, and whether we call TIA or stroke. Here, the definition clarifies it has to be without acute infarction. Then, that brings up the issue, 
how do we know the patient had acute infarction or not? Again, if we did just the CT of the head, probably we are not likely to find the acute infarction. As opposed to if we use the modern technology, MRI with a diffusion-weighted imaging, we are likely to see a diffusion uh, deficit. In that case, probably that should be called as an acute stroke. So this particular definition, the second definition is extremely important. And uh, I, when we demonstrate, not only for a patient's sake, and also for a adherence of the treatment, and also the, uh, to give the emphasis to the individual and the treating healthcare providers that it is not just the TIA, it is actually stroke that actually brings the patient to the hospital, and also they pay more attention to the secondary stroke prevention, ultimately better outcome. As opposed to even TIA, even there is no acute infarction, still the mechanism is safe, but however, we don't, generally speaking, pay attention. So, TIA and the stroke are, in my opinion, both the, the same mechanism, but the terminology is somewhat different, but we should pay, uh, pay very, very good attention to TIAs and treat the same way that we address acute stroke. Why stroke is important? We all know in this room, when pe we have treated uh, people with a stroke, it's not only for the individual, it is also for the family, society, it's a big burden if, they, if there is a deficit. And also, as we all know, that a stroke is the leading cause of a disability, not only in the United States, in the entire world. And also, the deficits depend on the age, uh, profile, social status of the patient, and also, importantly, the age. If the patient is younger, they're likely to have more impact on the community. Uh, we have scores of examples. I just saw a uh, gentleman uh, yesterday. He was being treated for a, a dissection, 42-year-old plumber, and he's a physic and a right hemiparatic, so now he can't go to work. And this is a patient, even though the uh, uh, dissection has healed, he's a, still he can go to his previous job, thereby affecting his family, and also he has young children, so they are going to be affected as well. So the impact is significant. So coming to the classification of stroke or mechanisms of stroke, we all know that there are, this is a, based on the TOAST classification. If you break them into, mind you, this uh, TOAST classification has been in vogue uh, for many, many years. 20 to 30 percent is uh, etrothrombotic, 20 percent cardioembolic, 15 to 20 is a small vessel or lacunar, 5 to 10 percent is uncommon. But look at the other one. We don't know about 25 to 30 percent based on this uh, or cryptogenic. So what is cryptogenic stroke? So we understand ischemic stroke is, affects brain, spinal cord, and retinal. And also there are different mechanisms, etherothrombotic, basically carotid stenosis, for example, or intracranial stenosis, intra or extracranial stenosis, then the cardioembolic, originating from the heart, and then we have small vessel disease, mostly with the hypertension, diabetes, uh, that is the, uh, uh, usually they have the risk factors, and then unknown, or some special, uh, etiology like uh, 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 antiphospholipid antibody or some unusual causes like a dissection, that's only a small proportion of the patients. Then, then we have 30% up to cryptogenic. So what is cryptogenic? Cryptogenic stroke is generally refers to a stroke for which there is no specific attributable cause after comprehensive evaluation for the most common causes. That is the definition given by that. So what, what does it include? That include extensive cardiac, vascular, 
hematological and serological evaluation, or there may be incomplete evaluation, or evidence of more than one competing cause. For example, if there is a, a patient, say, 65 or 70-year-old gentleman who has a, say, moderate to severe degree of carotid stenosis and also has atrial fibrillation, or to make it a little bit complicated, has a PFO. So which one caused the problem? So, I mean, based on the imaging, we may be able to, uh, sometimes we may be able to tell which is the uh, cause to uh, problem for that individual, but generally that could be caused as a, that could be classified as a cryptogenic stroke. So again, when do you call cryptogenic? As for the definition, we have to have extensive cardiovascular, hematological, and serological evaluation. But some authorities say, in terms of cardiovascular evaluation, transthoracic echocardiogram is enough. Some people say transesophageal echocardiogram is mandatory before you call it cryptogenic. In any which case, my view is a patient needs to get what they need. Say, if you do not get a reasonable explanation for the ischemic stroke that you are treating, then obviously the other treatment, other investigation need to be done to find out the cause. But this issue of a TE becomes a, a, a becomes a problem when there are resources are not available. In certain hospitals, TE is not readily available because of the services that are not offered. Obviously, that patient is called cryptogenic. In certain big hospitals, TE is routinely done as part of the stroke evaluation. Probably their rate of uh, detection is quite high, and their percentage from their data bank, the percentage of cryptogenic would be somewhat lower. According to the Crystal AF study that was published recently, the, in their study, the cryptogenic stroke was defined as the patient should have at least MRI or CT, 12-lead EKG, 24-hour ECG monitoring or Holter monitoring as an outpatient. And as you see, transesophageal echocardiogram is a must before calling it a cryptogenic stroke, and also CTA or MRA or conventional angiography to make sure that there is no extracranial or intracranial stenosis. And also, in people with under 55, must have prothrombic, uh, sorry, uh, prothrombotic state evaluation. So that means a, a hypercoagulable workup. So when all this is satisfied, they call it a cryptogenic stroke. Some, if you read the literature, some of the studies uh, after transthoracic cardiogram, uh, echocardiogram, they call it cryptogenic. So there is a little bit of a controversy in terms of a cryptogenic stroke. So if we look at the German data bank, there is 23% of uh, uh, patients are cryptogenic. And also, as you can see, 40% of uh, patients, that means the younger the patient, with the stroke, the higher the rate of cryptogenic stroke diagnosis. So that's been studied uh, either by clinical evaluations or with the MRI data. The younger the patient, the more likely they have a cryptogenic stroke. So why we are talking of the cryptogenic stroke? From the beginning, I said, if we know the stroke mechanism, we are able to care for the patient better. Say, for example, if the patient is a cardioembolic from a atrial fibrillation, that patient would require anticoagulation, thereby reducing the secondary stroke risk almost uh, two-thirds. As opposed to, if we do not know, we can't really offer the best treatment. So there is a paucity of data for, to get the secondary prevention. Even the current guidelines either did not give statements specifically on cryptogenic stroke or recommended antiplatelet agent. 
So even though we don't know, when we call cryptogenic, we don't know the mechanism, still the statements, uh, the guidelines said, okay, if, if you diagnose a patient with a cryptogenic stroke in the absence of any detectable cause, just give antiplatelet agent. And there is only one randomized study, anti, uh, anticoagulation versus uh, aspirin, and there was no difference in the primary outcome of ischemic stroke or death. So there are obviously there are no more data need to be come out in terms of cryptogenic stroke. So this is, then we sometimes we thought PF4, once we find PF4, yes, we'll put them in anticoagulation, but that proved to be not the case in people who have PF4 on comedin or anticoagulation did not do any better than people on aspirin. So that did not do well. And then, to give you, PF4 is normally present probably in this room, probably up to a quarter of patients would have PF4. That's the statistics, up to 23% of the people, nor, uh, general population has a PF4. So people with a stroke and PF4, then in unselected patients, the closer device was done, and again, that, that study did not show us that there is any benefit. Not only that we don't have too much data in terms of a cryptogenic stroke, if you look at it, the risk of secondary stroke for cryptogenic stroke is a significantly high. And there is an average after stroke, the risk of a recurrence stroke depending on the literature, anything from three to 10%, three to eight percent or so, leaving alone the atrial fibrillation. But in a cryptogenic stroke patients, there's a 30% recurrent stroke in a relatively one year, a short period of one year, and another study found 14.5. So the risk of compared to three or five percent or seven percent, this is significantly high. So that's another reason that we need to pay attention to cryptogenic stroke. And this is just to show you that the risk of recurrence for average overall stroke patients is roughly three to four percent. Then there's a perception. Because no distinctive treatment is often recommended in patients with cryptogenic stroke, physicians and patients may otherwise not take adherence to prescribed treatment as seriously as they should, given the high risk of recurrence. So even though we don't have data, we don't have treatments, and then even what are the treatment that is given, people, uh, patients do not take that seriously. So in, in every sphere, cryptogenic stroke is not very good once we give, make that diagnosis. But the good news is there are some advanced radiological techniques or cardiac techniques or imaging, I should say, diagnostic imaging is out there to utilize to help with the diagnosis. Once, if we use these modalities appropriately in a carefully selected patients, probably that chunk of 20 or 25 or 30 percent of the cryptogenic stroke population might diminish to uh, might diminish, but I cannot estimate how much would diminish. Generally speaking, about a quarter of patients with a cryptogenic stroke probably has atrial fibrillation as the cause. So what are the challenges with the cryptogenic stroke? So imagine a patient with a ischemic stroke and we evaluate, and all we find is, say, if, uh, I'm just uh, giving out this number, say 50% or 55% stenosis of the uh, ipsilateral carotid or intracranial vessel. So that's, uh, there's a plaque, but we normally do not consider plaque 40 or 50% as the definitive cause for a stroke. But there, is, there may be, a term called plaque vulnerability, 
in cardiac literature, they, there is a significant uh, data that even though plaque is small, if it is ulcerated or if it is uh, giving out a lot of emboli from that, there is a risk of uh, myocardial infarction. Same might apply for ischemic stroke patients as well. And also, there may be transitory causes like atrial fibrillation, not the persistent atrial fibrillation, but paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that may be a cause for a cryptogenic stroke. The other example I can give you is a, recently I saw a 50-year-old woman that came to the uh, hospital with a two-day history of headache, and she basically has only sensory symptoms on the uh, one side, and she did have a small uh, thalamic stroke, uh, I believe, sorry, small stroke, and she, sorry, not a thalamic stroke, she had a small hemispheric stroke, but she was found to have, we thought it was a dissection in the carotid artery. She's only 50. She was discharged home on anticoagulation. A week later, she came back, and she had, we repeat, uh, because of the similar symptoms again, and we repeated the same studies, and uh, the, whatever we thought the dissection that has completely resolved, that gives me idea that this may be a vasospasm. Vasospasm could actually, can cause a stroke. So this transitory causes that need to be evaluated Sometimes we don't inadequate evaluation or ignore identification of cause in the absence of common conditions such as AF and carotid stenosis. Say, we did not find carotid stenosis or AF, that means the patient has no other disease and patient may have factor V Leiden for all practical purposes or patient could have uh, lupus anticoagulant. So these are the things that need to be evaluated. So what are the different advanced technology that we can use? First of all, carotid, sten uh, uh, sorry, carotid duplex or a, a neurovascular ultrasound. When I mean to say neurovascular ultrasound, there's a carotid duplex and a transcranial Doppler. So both technologies can be used to help in a carotid plaque to see whether there's really a problematic plaque or a vulnerable plaque or not. That, that way, actually, the transcranial Doppler can give us the how many emboli are going into the brain. So that information would be valuable in certain patients. So a combination of carotid duplex and the transcranial Doppler evaluations would be very, very helpful in certain patients. And also, there's the MRI techniques, the wall imaging technology is coming into vogue, and that may actually, actually, more than this, this film is more, we can see better. You can see that uh, the enhancement of the wall of the middle cerebral artery, that may be the cause for a stroke, even though there is a, a not much plaque in the, within the carotid. So wall imaging technology may be also useful in evaluating these patients. Then the problem with the transitory causes, especially paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, is uh, when we take history, we need to be careful, and that, would be, that will give us some insight into whether the patient has a, a atrial fibrillation or not. Otherwise, there is a cardiac imaging technology now that the left atrial morphology apparently gives us, sorry, apparently has a higher, uh, sorry, certain types of morphology has a higher incidence of a stroke or embolism. And as you can see, there are different morphologies of a left atrium. This is the chicken wing, most common, and different types, cactus, windsock, and a cauliflower, a cauliflower type. And if you see the 
the risk of a stroke from these different morphological left atrial appendage, you can see chicken wing is the best one to have morphology wise because non chicken wing morphology was found to be almost 80 percent, sorry, chicken wing morphology is 80 percent, almost 80 percent less likely to have a ischemic stroke. So not only knowing the left atrial size, morphology is also important. I think cardiologists probably would be doing more and more of this in the future. Then this transitory, sorry, transitory causes, I'm concentrating more on the atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is extremely difficult to diagnose. The current guidelines in terms of ischemic stroke recommend cardiac monitoring up to 24 hours. We all know 24 hours is not enough. Uh, then once the patient is uh, discharged from the hospital, if the, if the patient get uh, cardiac monitoring in the hospital, usually they go on the halt or monitor for three to five days or sometimes seven days. But again, the detection rates are variable in terms of uh, halt or monitoring as well. Most likely people get another five or six percent uh, in terms of uh, detection. So uh, just to illustrate the point of uh, how, how much it takes uh, to detect uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, I thought I would present this case. This is a 78-year-old woman, hypertension, high cholesterol, sudden onset of vision loss in left eye, left hemianopsia, left hemiparesis, but she came to the hospital within one and a half hour. She was considered for a TPA, but ultimately we did not end up giving TPA. This patient should have received TPA uh, when she initially came to the emergency room. What happened was her daughter went to Wharton Business School, and she's very smart, obviously. She kept arguing with us for more than an hour why her mother should not get TPA. So we had no other, I mean, basically there was no consent uh, signed, so we decided not to give. Further imaging showed, as you can see, her vertebrals are clear as much as I can tell, but you can see the, there is a carotid stenosis. So this, this, this distribution is a vertebral basilar, that carotid stenosis is asymptomatic in this particular patient. This is. A, so we started her on a, she was treated with IV heparin. And then while she was in the rehab, she had this new stroke. So this is definitely in the carotid distribution. So that asymptomatic carotid disease is now symptomatic. And also mind you, this is a different vascular distribution. So this is a vertebral vascular distribution. This is a carotid distribution. So then she had further stroke as depicted in this uh, MRI. So the question is, how long did it take? Ultimately, this patient ended up having atrial fibrillation. Do you, have, do you guys have any idea how long it took to make that diagnosis of atrial fibrillation in this patient. So is it a seven days, one month, three months, six months, a year? Any, a year? Okay. So roughly just over six months before we finally made the diagnosis and the patient went on anticoagulation. After she went on anticoagulation, she did not have any stroke, but we did not address the issue of uh, uh, carotid stenosis. Patient was the last follow up uh, for the last year or so. I haven't seen her. Her uh, left atrial size was 3.8. Right, right at the cusp. 
But at the time, I mean, I did not know about this morphology. I just learned about this LAA morphology recently. So this case illustrates, even though we do monitoring in, in hospital, if we are lucky, we get it. We do seven, uh, seven days outpatient monitoring. The detection rate for them from this it's very variable. Uh, again, these patients, as I said earlier in the talk, it depends on how we select our patients. Some of the studies in this chart are done without prior TEE. Some studies are done after TEE. So studies that were done, generally speaking, studies that were done without TEE showed higher prevalence of uh, atrial fibrillation. Studies done with the TEE, after TEE, showed somewhat lesser. So that tells us something, that TEE is crucial, or is one of the important diagnostic tools that is generally available in many, many hospitals, should be used. Either it detects aortic arch atheroma, but not all aortic arch atheromas are culprits for stroke. Obviously, there are greater than four millimeters and also thicker size and uh, mobile plaques and all these different uh, things that go on. And also, as Dr. Malik was mentioning about left atrial size, that's very, very important. Usually, four millimeters and higher seems to be, the, uh, four millimeters seems to be the cutoff. So, and again, the duration of atrial fibrillation, whether it's 30 seconds, is a 30 seconds of a detection of 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation is important as opposed to two minutes, six minutes, or six hours of atrial fibrillation. I don't think anybody knows the answer, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, in an ischemic stroke patient, if I find atrial fibrillation, even for a two minutes, I am apt to offer anticoagulation. But opinions might differ in terms of uh, atrial fibrillation and the duration. Uh, that's open for debate. And also, the timing. Don't think that patient has, say, atrial fibrillation at 7 a.m. in the morning. It doesn't mean that 7 a.m. would be the onset of ischemic stroke as well. There's a good literature to support that even though patients have gone into atrial fibrillation at 7 a.m., the stroke could be the next following day. Or maybe the stroke has happened prior, uh, the previous day, and then patient is in the hospital, then we detect atrial fibrillation. So there's a lot of data uh, in terms of uh, this timing. But atrial fibrillation and ischemic stroke timing do not correspond. I just want to make sure that we all understand that point because now this ischemic stroke has happened, so there is no atrial fibrillation. That's not necessarily true. So there is a newer technology in terms of uh, monitoring. So we are all familiar with the uh, EKG. We are all familiar with the uh, halter monitoring. We all familiar with MCART technology, which is event monitor that can extend the monitoring for about uh, 28 days. But the problem with that uh, monitoring is uh, people have to have wired, and there is a box that goes in, just like my microphone with a wire. But with this reveal, this, this is a subcutaneously implantable device and the size is very small now. I mean, previously there is a reveal. Now it is a reveal link. It's a actually, I think as you see in that picture, that's the actual size. And it can be actually injected under local into the subcutaneous area over the chest near the heart. And there is no wires. And basically this transmits wirelessly to a central station. 
If patient actually feels something, he can alert the doctor or he can mark it and the cardiologist office can download the information and analyze. So this is a nice technology. And the crystal AF study basically showed that the detection rate is uh, superior than control. Control is basically the EKG or Holter monitoring. And again, these particular, in this particular study, the people had transesophageal echocardiogram at, at a baseline. So these are already a screened population from average stroke patient. So these are, uh, they have eliminated patients from either bigger LAA size or uh, aortic atheroma. These kind of patients are already eliminated and these are far more advanced in terms of uh, diagnosis. Even in those patients, they have showed at six months their detection rate is a eight point, uh, almost a six-fold increase compared to the, uh, uh, the control group. And when they monitored up to three years, the detection rate was uh, up to 30%. So what it tells us is the longer that we monitor, the higher the chance of a detection rate. I mean, one can question, once we monitor three years, obviously patients are going to develop even without this, I mean, just by the nature of the age, they can develop a fib, probably not related to the uh, stroke itself. But uh, even at 12 months, which is reasonable, even at 12 months, there is a, a eight-fold increase in terms of diagnosis of uh, atrial fibrillation. And most of the patients in this study, once they detected the a fib, they all went into oral anticoagulants, almost 98% of the people. So what are the risk factors for uh, oral, uh, sorry, uh, atrial fibrillation? The older the uh, person is, the higher the chance of getting atrial fibrillation. And also the vascular risk factors and the higher CHADs or CHAD VAS scores. Uh, the left, uh, sorry, frequent PACs are sometimes uh, there is a, uh, Atrial tachycardia sometimes could be a precursor for uh, atrial fibrillation. Again, size of the left atrium sometimes gives us uh, an indication whether the patient is going to have atrial fibrillation or not. And also, the imaging pattern would also give us, I will go through that in a second, the imaging pattern, multi-territorial multi -ter infarctions are a single ter territory but big infarction could be cardioembolic. So, so far we talked about in terms of cryptogenic, even though the plaque is small, plaque vulnerability, and also we talked about the left atrial appendage evaluations, and also we talked about the longer term monitoring with the reveal monitoring. But there is another sector of people who would be classified as a cryptogenic stroke, that will be cancer related. So the patient may have occult cancer, but usually, typically, they have small infarcts in a multiple territories or a multiple small infarcts. And in those patients, D-dimer evaluation might help us to guide the diagnosis. So don't forget, occult cancers can cause stroke. So, how can we evaluate these patients on a routine basis? This is a, this, this uh, uh, table just uh, came out recently by uh, Columbia Group. This is what they are proposing. So, we do our baseline evaluations for a, a stroke and TIA with the usual workup. If we find, so that's well and good, we can institute secondary stroke uh, uh, prevention. Then if you, we do not, and basic, uh, 
if we have the lacuna stroke and they have the vascular risk factors, again, we institute the secondary stroke mechanism or a secondary stroke prevention strategy for them. Then there's a group of patients that they look like a small strokes, but lacuna-like looking strokes, but they don't have vascular risk factors, then they come into a uh, cryptogenic category. In those patients, PE is one of them, and Holter or long-term monitoring with a implantable uh, loop recorders, such as a, a link. And also, they can have additional lab testing, prothrombic state, or in rare cases, CSF examination might be helpful. Syphilis is no longer a cause here in the United States, so the, that's another uh, CSF evaluation might be helpful. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, in the last 10, 15 years, I have not done a CSF exam for a stroke, but still, that can be, uh, that has to be considered. Uh, generally speaking, serological evaluation. So this is one way for looking at, a, uh, in terms of for guiding the uh, diagnosis for a cryptogenic stroke. There's another way with the newer technology is uh, looking at the lesion pattern on DWI. So we can look at uh, whether large cortical, large cortical infarction or small scattered infarcts, we can actually look at the DWI or whether it is a deep infarct, just like it looks like a lacoon, but it is not a deep infarct, but it is not a lacoon. Usually that deep infarct could be an intracranial branch occlusion, a, a penetrating branch occlusion. So that would be some form of a atherosclerotic disease. So for that, people do not get benefit from anticoagulation. That would be treatment antiplatelet agent. So going back to the large cortical, it could be single territory or multiple territory. So that's usually when we have a large cortical infarct, most of the time it is cardioembolic, but it could be cancer related as well. So don't forget malignancy as the cause of stroke. So that's why when we see large stroke, one category, sorry, more than one vascular territories, think about cancer other than cardioembolic. Then, small scattered infarcts, it could be, athero, say, for example, small scattered, it could be from the carotid disease. We can see lots of uh, infarcts from the carotid disease, lots of scattered infarcts. If it is in the single territory, an intracranial uh, stenosis, intracranial arterial stenosis can cause small scattered infarcts. But if it is a multiple territory, again, cancer comes into play. Then the MRI also helps us, not only DWI, the flare sequences will help us to detect whether there is any previous stroke. If there is a previous uh, history of a previous stroke, that will tell us or give us some indication that this may be, there may be a cardioembolism or some form of a other embolic disease as the cause of a ischemic stroke. To illustrate this, I took a, a case. So this is a 62-year-old woman came to the office probably, uh, sorry, she was seen in the hospital roughly two or three months ago with the balance issues. Obviously, she had a cerebellar stroke, but as you can see, the, her blood vessels are completely clean. She did not have any a detectable cause for stroke, but when we did the MRI, sorry, on the same MRI, she had other old strokes that tells us that obviously this territory is very different. This ischemic stroke, that index stroke is very different from this, uh, these strokes. So uh, now we have a patient with an index stroke in the cerebellum and a different territory 
with the small infarcts. So the question is, what do we do next? She had, she, she had all the work up 24 hour, sorry, she had EKG 24 hour in hospital monitoring. TE was normal. Nuclear stress test was normal. And she, she's on an antiplatelet agent. And what is the next step? She's about 62. She's completely, I mean, she's back to herself and she's working normal. Now she's back to her work. So with her lesion pattern, she has a multi-territorial small infox. What is the etiology? She's a really a cryptogenic stroke. All the prothrombic workup was negative for her. There's nothing. And also we screened for stro uh, cancer. There was no cancer. There's no breast cancer or lung cancer for her. She's not a, she was never a smoker. So what do we do now? So whether we put her in anticoagulation, whether we use a SEEK. SEEK is a, another cardiac monitoring technology, just like a MCOT with the wires. SEEK is a, it's like a, a patch that is applied and it's a wireless technology uh, that uh, base, uh, the, the, it sends the information to a, a central station and uh, they provide the report. Link, as I said, this is intracardiac, uh, sorry, uh, implantable loop, loop recorder under the skin or do nothing, masterly in activity. So any takers for this, uh, any, any seek? Seek can only be done from any seven days to 20, uh, 28 days. So I, I do not know. I mean, obviously, we are not going to subject her to oral anticoagulation because the risk, we don't know. Masterly inactivity probably is not the best idea. Uh, probably 62. She's 62. So it's between seek and link. I chose to put her on link. So she had it uh, link inserted. So we are waiting for whether she would have any atrial fibrillation. So say after one year, if I don't find anything, so probably I will be pushed to make some other judgment call for her. I mean, SEEK is a relatively new technology. I think it is out only for the last two, three months. And right now, as far as I know, SEEK is only approved for Medicare, not now for a commercial uh, patients. So, obvious, so with this newer diagnostic techniques, we can say if we evaluate cryptogenic stroke patients, either MRI with a special attention to vas vessel or left atrial appendage imaging, or use of uh, existing technology such as uh, carotid, uh, sorry, uh, duplex and uh, transcranial Doppler technology to our advantage with the bubble studies, or loop recorders or extended cardiac monitoring may give us some proportion of the patients. And also, some of the MRIs may help us to detect the branch occlusions intracranially, so that will also reduce some of the patients that go into the uh, uh, bucket of a cryptogenic stroke. If we apply all these technologies, actually we can actually reduce the, uh, the number of people that are diagnosed with the cryptogenic stroke to smaller number. So on the left side of the panel, you see the traditional toast classification, atherosclerotic, small arterial occlusion, cardioembolic, other causes, and cryptogenic. With the advanced imaging technologies that the middle small arterial occlusion, sorry, the atherosclerotic disease can be atheroembolic from the atherosclerotic disease in the iota, or Iotoembolic or branch occlusive disease in the intracranial. So that section becomes bigger. And also, if you look at the cardioembolic, the 
some patients will be diagnosed with a paroxysmal at atrial fibrillation or paradoxical embolism. Ultimately, the cryptogenic population would be very small. Hopefully, all these patients would get appropriate secondary prevention strategies so that their risk of disability, risk of recurrence would be less. And so, I think we, ha uh, we had to use these technologies to our advantage. These are some of these existing technology, not necessarily newer technology. So I stopped here and uh, I'm open for any questions.